the intros. Um, let's start with you, Pablo. All right. So uh, I'm Pablo Zamorano. Uh, I um, I come from uh, Hedwig Studio in London. Uh, Hedwig Studio is uh, about a 250 people um, uh, team uh, working on um, design and architecture at any scale uh, on any kind of uh, possible uh, use and, and context uh, in the world uh, without uh, any kind of specific uh, specialty. Uh, that being said, uh, I lead the geometry and computational design, which is a team of specialists uh, with some uh, sorting, uh, similar to kind of probably the, the crowd today, um, uh, some kind of a, a pretty good skills for understanding complexity, uh, playing around with computers and um, solving kind of autom automating uh, uh, problems uh, across the studio. Uh, we are about um, five people uh, working on the kind of applied research side of uh, the team, uh, plus another 10 more that uh, are more involved in projects with uh, some time assigned uh, to applied research. Hey, um, I'm Pragya Gupta and I work at NBBJ. I head the design computation team there, but I have a background in performance analytics. Um, so, you know, my job's really easy to be honest because I work with a team of brilliant and highly motivated experts. Um, they're all experts in their own verticals. Um, we're very, very project focused. So my entire team is embedded in different studios and we try and have one or two design computation leaders in each studio across the firm. So a lot of, you know, a lot of the solutions that we have, a lot of our motivation comes from project problems and, you know, real world problems. Uh, but we do come together on a firm wide level to solve, you know, different kind of um, things that we see, um, you know, sort of commonly and also look at emerging trends and look at, you know, emerging technologies. Um, so it's a mix of, you know, just a little bit of exploratory research and uh, bringing that applied research to our practice at large, educating the firm on new technologies and thinking about you know different adoption um, strategies, but then also being you know project focused at all times. First of all, I say there are empty seats here. You can come and sit. You're not going to get any taller. I have tried this for years, and I'm telling you, it doesn't work. <laughs> um, so my name is Martha Tsegeri. Uh, I'm leading the applied R&D team at Foster and Partners. Uh, I am the least clever person in my team, uh, and uh, I'm very, very blessed to be with 21 incredible, talented people who do everything from complex geometry, parametric design, uh, to uh, back and front-end development, performance-driven design applications. We're writing our own simulation, uh, simulation engines. Uh, we're doing GPU computing, distributed computing. We developed our own digital twin applications, our own interoperability applications, our own machine learning applications. Yeah, a lot of applications. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we're having fun. We're always 1% of the company. The company now is 2,000 strong. So yeah, that's it. Are you on one mic? Well, there's three over here and, and one over here. I, uh, You're supposed I'm, to leave three on the table and just pass one around the whole time. <laughs> uh, Luke. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> uh, I'm Luke Wilson, and as of about six months ago, the global head of design technology, which has been fantastic and overwhelming to get to know all the great teams. Um, KPF is about 650 across nine offices globally. Um, there's seven design technology teams, and underpinning that, is applied technology and software development. Um, kind of before coming into this role, I'd started and founded the uh, KPF Urban Interface Team, which focused on computational urban design, mapping urban data analytics, and software development. Um, and it's kind of interesting because that team came up sort of independent and then in, in parallel with the rest of the design technology team. So maybe good, good discussion today of how those things are are um, are integrating. If that makes sense. Thanks, Luke. Uh, so I'm Jason Steiner. I'm with Methune, a partner at Methune. Just, and also just acknowledge my deep uncomfort, lack of comfortability not having slides. <laughs> so this is super unusual, so I actually took notes. Um, and because we're on the East Coast, and I just kind of like to know the room I'm in, uh, folks who have heard of Methune, can you just like throw your hands up? 
Okay, there's a smattering. So I'm gonna take maybe 30 extra seconds and just kind of share who we are and what we do as we're predominantly a kind of West Coast firm who does work uh, nationally. So again, I'm Jason, I've been at Methune for 22 years, so quite a long time, partner there, and have sort of a varied role. So director of digital design, I lead our R&D work, I lead what's called the CoLab. We all probably have some iteration of the CoLab in our firms, uh, and I lead weird projects. So projects that don't like nicely fit into one of our categories of work that we do, I sort of get to lead those, which is pretty awesome. Um, and then I've been on the Methune board for about 10 years, our board of directors, which also kind of contextualizes how a practice like ours can integrate something like an R&D program and grow that to kind of the scale that we've been able to grow it in roughly about a decade. So I think that's sort of an important side note. Uh, a little bit about Methune. We've been around for 75 years. That is how you pronounce the firm, Methune. Uh, we've been through we're roughly four to five generations of leadership. Also important that we've been able to transition over time in a real intentional way. Uh, we're multidisciplinary. Uh, our stated goal is kind of designed for positive change. So that's positive change for people, positive change for the environment. Uh, we're multidisciplinary, so architecture, interiors, landscape, urban design, planning, and R&D sort of crosses all of that. Uh, we're a national practice. Two-thirds of our work is up and down uh, the West Coast. One-third of our work is kind of scattered across the country. And generally, the work fits in kind of one of three buckets, so sort of urban placemaking, more or less housing and mixed use, workplace, self-explanatory, and then education, which would be inclusive of K-12, higher ed, student housing, et cetera. And then we're really guided by four principles, which are important to kind of set the stage for kind of R&D and innovation. And I'll hold on the description of our R&D because I think that'll come out in our discussion. So kind of our four guiding principles are a collaborative, interdisciplinary model, uh, the deepest commitment to sustainable design, centering equity in everything we do, and really the thought that innovation and research can spark change. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I think this will probably be a pass the mic down the line question for all of you. Um, you, you know, you'd have to imagine that like R&D in architectural practice is as old as architectural practice itself. But each of your firms has a unique history of how these groups started. So um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about what that history is, to the best of your knowledge. You know, some of you are inheriting groups. Um, and I'd also like to hear your perspective on what actually constitutes um, R&D and how closely is that related to kind of a design technology specialist group. Um, and just to frame that a little bit, I sat in this room for I think the first AEC Tech and saw Shane Berger present on Woods Baggett's design technology team and kind of telling this story about um, Case, remember them, consulting uh, for Woods Baggett. And the first thing they said is you've got to separate your design technology group from your IT group. But neither of those things is also necessarily R&D. So I'd be interested in hearing, I know I have knowledge of like, you know, KPF and Foster and Partners going way back with, with this stuff, but I'd like to hear all of your perspectives on what are, what are the origins of R&D in your firm to the best of your knowledge and how have you differentiated that from specialist technology practice in IT? I'll start. Uh, so, uh, so Heatherwick Studio, it's about 30 years old, okay? So uh, it's still, I would say, a young yeah. kind of a firm. And uh, R&D, uh, it's been, in a way, always part of uh, the studio, even though, you know, a computer may not have been around, you know, uh, so heavily in the, in the very beginning, although they kind of did. Um, what I mean by R&D or how R&D was uh, kind of part of the design process, it was essentially that. It was part of the design process. Uh, craft, uh, it's been always uh, kind of an essential part of, of uh, what we do, and that means that um, we like to design things that are challenging uh, in terms of, of geometry, but also that explore uh, kind of the possibilities that um, any material can kind of bring to kind of the equation. And we try to push those limits as far as, as we can to generate you know, in incredible spaces. Um, for, for people. So that means that uh, for every single project we design, we need to come up not only with kind of the design for the project or, or to understand kind of the, the, the physical constraints of them, uh, but rather 
and we needed to come up with the tools to create them. And because we were kind of pushing the, the kind of the boundaries from the very beginning, that meant that we couldn't, for instance, find contractors to build our projects. And I think the first project we built, uh, kind of a, a set of um, uh, artist studios for a university in, in Arisworth, uh in the UK, um, was built by us. You know, so we needed to set up a uh, company, in, a parallel company actually, and, and we built it ourselves. So um, I think that's how R&D kind of came into play uh, to the studio. So exploration has been always there. Uh, but the, 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 ideal, the idea of, of tooling has been always there. Now, um, around 2000, uh, sorry, yeah, 2015, um, the studio went uh, kind of from being a, a kind of an 80 people uh, studio to, uh, you know, something like, you know, 100 and then 150 plus and, and, and started to get closer to the 200. So, um, so we needed to start uh, thinking in how we could kind of implement uh, this uh, design culture uh, across all the projects that, that were kind of happening uh, simultaneously. Um, uh, we also discovered that, you know, we were obviously re reinventing the wheel with every project that we were working on. Um, and at that, you know, particular time, we had something like 20 projects working in parallel. So uh, it wasn't the most efficient kind of way uh, of doing it. And, um, and we also kind of realized that uh, we were heavily dependent on people that uh, really understood very well uh, physical constraints and were able to um, apply them all throughout the design process, including you know uh, the digital part uh, of, of them. So, so we had some really good skills uh, internally uh, that were working in silos, um, and so we decided to kind of um, start to link them uh, together and, and and create a specialist uh, team. So. So about five years ago, so actually in 2017, we work on a, uh, let's say a, a strategy for a computational design in the studio. Uh, and um, we started end of 2017, well, with one person, myself. So that's very recent. Yeah. Um, and, um, and we started growing from there. Um, the, the team basically was uh, officially created in uh, the beginning of 2018, um, and that kind of, uh, Take us to today. The, the kind of the things uh, uh, that we that we did uh, is changed dramatically, and how we do it is also changed dramatically. Um, I think in the beginning was uh, a lot about um, complex modeling, um, prototyping, um, physical simulations, uh, and then kind of it went to uh, uh, environmental analysis, um, XR, uh, and and you know it's oh sorry I forgot interoperability. Did I mention that? Um, a lot of interoperability, uh, but then then kind of uh, Flux was supposed to solve that anyway, but then it didn't. Well, let's yeah. You know, well, let's anyway. let's put a pin in that stuff too. You're you're actually answering my next seven questions. Too. Okay, okay. So, Sorry. Like, I, thought you, I thought you wanted the story. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's good. So yeah, let's let's stick to kind of the the origin story. So you're you know you're, you're like so it came out yeah. as, as a necessity, you know, um, due to the growth yeah. essentially, you know. But uh, R and D, it's been part of the culture since day one. Yeah, you know, I but, but, it, but, it, but it's interesting what I'm gathering from that is that the, the formalization of that and how it related to kind of day-to-day -day practice, which we'll dig into more, really kind of coalesced more recently after yeah. that, so it took a while to, to learn. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it certainly has uh, evolved, you know, from yeah. uh, people that could use Grasshopper to, you know, developing tools to developing plugins to developing apps. Yeah, okay. So you're from an older firm. <coughs> So I, I really don't know how to start on our history with R&D, because like Pablo mentioned, it's, it's in our DNA. Um, and I think if I look at R&D just from a technology per perspective, I would, be, I would be doing disservice to you know, all of our designers and principals yeah. and partners who've you know, just integrated R&D into their craft um, since, since we were made. Um, and it, it kind of shows up in some of our early um, you know, it starts to show up from some of our early work. Um, so if you Google the basket house, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, but I would also like to say that does not define it. The Longer Burger Basket Company in Ohio? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, no matter how 
how eccentric that project is. I'm sure there was a ton of R&D that went into it. And it, it is in our DNA from a craft perspective, um, you know, from our model studio, um, which is highly integrated to specifications and materiality and all of those things. So I don't know if, you know, I should really get into the history of R&D. Um, but if I talk about the design computation team and the evolution of our technology um, team, it really started with, um, just a bunch of technology nerds coming together, um, building a computational advocacy group, doing really cool things. Um, you know, for example, and a lot of people are here in this room, including Pablo, um, who's worked at NBBJ, and you know, Nathan Miller, um, who demonstrated um, to our leadership with the Hang Sao. Uh, museum and you know they still rave about it and they still talk about it and you know they he kind of set the stage for what computational design um, and what technology can do for projects um, and then you know Nate um, Holland and um, just you know Dan and uh, Mark Seep and like we've just had like you know, all of these leaders who are now leading the industry come out from NBBJ. Um, so it really started with these people coming together um, and building, you know, just coming together and talking about technology, talking about, you know, educating the firm, uh, demonstrating the value to our project teams. Um, you know, it turned into an advocacy group, it turned into grasshopper user um, groups and finally formalized into our computation um, team eventually that is now, you know, 20 and, people who are... And when did that formalization... Oh happen? my God, I would not know. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh, I'm, but it's, I think we've been sort of, you know, formally or less formally together for over a decade now. Okay. Um, and, you know... Um, so when Nate was doing it, it was chaotic and then you brought some structure <laughs> to it. Yeah. Let's go with yeah. that. Okay. Let's go with that. <laughs> no, that's, that's interesting. I'm... Did not expect you to mention the Longerberger Basket Company building in your response to us. So that's that's a real. Thing. If you don't know what that is, like you whip out your phone right it. now. Yeah. It's it's fun. It is you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's part of our well, history. Well, and you have um and yeah. Let's let's move on to to Martha, but we should come back too because NBBJ has a very kind of like distributed regional structure that you know we should talk about that as well. But yeah, thank you. The mic distribution sure. is, yeah. We've got our Okay, good. Uh, so I, I, I need to say, so I don't get fired, we love R&D. We always love R&D, 55 years of R&D <laughs> um, <laughs> in the office. And uh, which is actually very true. Norman has been a pioneer in technology uh, when it comes to architecture. Uh, the first time that I know that uh, computational design has been used for the office war was more than 25 years ago when we did the Bridge Museum Great Court Group, and at the time uh, they had to involve uh, Chris Williams from Bath University and Mark Berry from the famous Sagrada Familia, Mark Berry, because they were building a space frame. I, I'm, I'm hoping that you know what building I'm talking about, and if you haven't seen it, go and see it. And they were trying to create a space frame that effectively translated from a rectangular boundary to a circular boundary in the, in the center on a listed building over a double curved surface. So they had to effectively write a topology optimization do dynamic relaxation, which Mar uh, Chris Williams wrote as a separate application thing in JavaScript about back in the day to do that. And they start using them for things like that enough to realize that it's much cheaper and better to have a team like that in-house, uh, at which point uh, I, I believe um, I believe it started with Hugh Whitehead, who came to the office and started uh, with, with Francis, the team, 25 years ago. And uh, I joined the office 17 years ago in that team. And uh, so that was 2006. And then 2010, we spun off uh, in applied R&D, uh, which started with four people. And that was a miserable first year. And uh, we went from four people to 22 people. A miserable people. first year because you were completely overloaded with work? Yes, or? Work, okay. I was doing 90 hour weeks, uh, 90 yeah. hour weeks, yeah. yeah. At, the, at the point where, when we had our Christmas dinner, like Adam and I still kind of think of that with a tear coming down our eye right? because <laughs> it was the first day in months that we actually could sit down yeah. and eat. Um, so it was great fun, but it was also very interesting because there was a lot of forward thinking. So. It started initially, didn't just start by, yes, let's do complex geometry, but let's just look into, back in the day, now we're talking 20 plus years ago, parametric design. 
and not parametric design of existing applications, but how can we develop our own parametric design application, let's say using Excel and VBA to drive a building directly in MicroStation, yeah, that sort of a parametric that design. That sounds horrible. <laughs> I don't know, I mean, uh, we, we've done a research, uh, um, Francis had done a research yeah. project with UCL 25 years ago on augmented reality collaborative virtual system that allowed for uh, collaboration in augmented reality with military headsets that cost 100K per mm -hmm. person at the time. Uh, so the aspirations of doing these things run way, way back. Uh, but to the point that when we created applied R&D, like complex geometries uh, are incredible and we still love them. I mean. We did the Mexico City Airport roof, and that was a non-mean fit. But then you're delving into so many more interesting things like performance-driven design. How do you take um, technologies outside the AC, from the film, the games industry, from aviation, and you see what is good for them and bring them into your reality, try to create better design faster, to give the power to a designer to make uh, informed decisions as they design, as they create options, and to analyze them in real time. And not just a building, but city scale models. How do you build people within the experience with uh, augmented virtual reality applications? How do you start looking into operation and data in operation? How do you use machine learning? The first machine learning ap applications we've done were six years ago now. And when can, you, can you remind me who the first architecture research team to research spot? Was? Yes, we yeah, were. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> we still love Spot. He has a Leonard and everything. He's a, he's an honorary, honorary member. You've seen the photograph. We have him like uh, photoshopped uh, in w with our team now, yeah, yeah. forever and ever. Uh, yeah, I mean uh, th this, uh, the point. So what we're trying to do is like not say, okay, what is the fad today? Let's try to do something so that we can look cool. The uh, the point I think for the for R and D for me is to look five, 10 years in the future and say, okay, what is out there that has nothing to do with architecture right now, but I can see that it can have a very significant way of changing uh, and completely reshaping the way that we do design, and how can we bring that to the hands of every designer today, but in a way that feels natural, without having to like impose things to people, but allowing them to work in the way that makes them more creative, uh, with these things as an augmentation of their creativity rather than a replacement or something that you shove down, down their throat yeah. because you think you're cleverer than them, which people you're not. It's just, uh, okay. Thank you. Are you chaperone now? <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna be the running joke. So similarly, KPF has kind of a long history of pervasive R&D across all the design studios and also within Design technology, I'm sure James Brogan, the CIO, is frantically texting me the history right now. So they'll be, I'll yeah, publish where the- is, where is he? Publish the essay. <laughs> yeah, I um, <laughs> <laughs> um, You know, but for example, we were early adopters of Rhino back in 2000, 2001, founders of Smart Geometry with a couple of others. Um, but I think maybe I'll jump to 2012, because that's when I came on and it helps coming out of that recession and reinvesting in R&D and what that meant for KPF. And so I was hired with my design partner from architecture school on the promise of a project we did where we built a, a computational urban design model that was showing the use of dredge material from the New York Harbor to extend lower Manhattan into a new neighborhood, lower, lower Manhattan or Lolo. And so we were pairing it with performance analysis tools, but also a real estate development performer working with real estate students. And so they hired us with the expectation of computational design, but with a subject matter expertise, architectural design, urban design, a little urban planning. And, and we this was, this was a, a new discipline coming in on top of the history of R&D? Yep, okay. yeah, yeah, so this is 2012 with, with a longer, a longer history and us coming in not knowing kind of that, that history and we had kind of a mandate and two guiding principles. The mandate was all R&D had to come through working directly with projects and understanding mm. what they needed. But then the driving principles were what's a sustainable density and how do you measure that and can you quantify the urban experience. So it was very focused around those. And very early on, what gave us kind of the agency was working with teams and 
understanding what was driving kind of value and decision making for clients. So we built digital versions of zoning regulations and a suite of view analysis tools. And what that did was within the first year, we were presenting to clients, we were in new project pitches, helping win, and sort, sort of shifted the value proposition. And then from that, it kind of grew into broader urban applications and software development, which I'm sure we'll get into more, but those were sort of the, the kind of coming in with a, a real subject matter focus and then getting really aligned to the core business in terms of what they're looking at winning projects. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know, James, I don't know if you remember me, but I was at KPF as a 19-year-old intern, um, and Kyle Steinfeld was giving us this, like, late-night workshop on how to use generative components, and I, like, could not wrap my head around a relative coordinate system. Like, that, that was, like, a bridge too far for me, and I was like, good thing I'll never have to do this in actual architecture practice. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've always thought of KPF as is definitely ahead of their time um, in the adoption of these things. Oh yeah, Charlie, this is, it should just be shout outs. We'll just go down and give <laughs> shout outs to everybody. For all the giants that came before. Jason. Uh, I was never at KPF. Um, <laughs> but, like, not, I'm not opposed, you know, like KPF is awesome. I was just never there. Uh, and one of my closest coworkers who's probably watching on uh, online somewhere was at KPF. Um, so maybe I'll go back, you know, as with everyone up here, I think the pervasive kind of history and culture of inquiry, optimism, curiosity, connection to kind of academia is just kind of who we are. We were founded by an academic and practitioner, and that's just kind of present in the core of kind of our DNA. But if we go back um, maybe 12 years, we started what's called the CoLab, which we don't market, we don't really share out there in the world. It's a bit of an enigmatic sort of presence at Methuen. And essentially, a couple of us uh, tended to be more of the digital kind of experts, just wanted to work in a different way. We didn't want to work around our desks with phones and things like that. We just grabbed a big table, borrowed a TV, kind of moved to a different part of the office and just started to experiment with how we work. And that effort has grown over the last 12, 13 years to where the CoLab is a really significant part of Methuen culture, where it's really the sandbox at Methuen, where the answer is kind of always yes, right? If there's a problem or an unknown, the answer in the CoLab is always and will always be yes, and you can never check it out. If there's an open seat, show up. And it's just kind of always on mentorship and collaboration. So that spirit and culture is part of Methuen. And then about, let's see, in 2016, uh, Bert Gregory, who was our CEO for about 15 years and myself, started or launched Methuen R&D. And so it started with a really small group of people who were completely and entirely empowered by the board and Methuen leadership to say, we know this matters, we believe it matters, and research is core to who we are and who our future, kind of who we are in the future. And so one fundamental principle is uh, we are creating new knowledge. If we're not creating new knowledge, it's not Methuen R&D. So that's sort of like the highest level kind of guiding principle. And so tech, technology, AI, computation is part of it, but it's not all of it. So we've sort of defined five key focus areas. Let's see if I can get them right off the cuff. Carbon, health and well-being, resilience, AI, and construction technology with sort of equity being kind of split across all of that as our five areas of focus. When we launched eight years ago, we essentially launched with internal grants. So the idea was that it was a grassroots approach. What's on people's mind? What's important to project teams? What are the unknowns? What are the areas where we need new knowledge to be able to get past a wall or innovate? And so that's how it started. So we authorized X amount of dollars. And we also wanted it to maintain and be sustainable in perpetuity. We didn't want it to be a peripheral thing that when times get hard, or there's economic uncertainty that it could drop off or could go away. We thought it was fundamental to our future. So we designed our kind of economic strategy and business model of R&D around that principle. So we started grassroots, and today we sort of have three big buckets of research. So one, internal grants, a yearly kind of call for proposals. We'll have five to seven internal grants. We were super naive eight years ago, and those were like, five to $20,000 grants, and that just didn't even scratch the surface of what was needed to do meaningful research. Mm. Now they tend to be fewer, bigger grants, where they're more like twenty dollars to $50,000 grants internally, mostly as a time allocation. Uh, 
with a strong preference towards teams who are partnering with academic institutions, other peer firms, et cetera, et cetera, knowing we can always do more uh, when we do it together, and that we want to share. It's not meant to be, like whatever everyone's definition of open source is, ours is that we inherently want to share the knowledge gain. So one bucket is internal grants. About a third of our research is direct connection to academic uh, world, specifically with UW and the Applied Research Consortium. So we'll have one or two full-time research fellows every year. One is Anik, who's out there and asked a hard question earlier. Uh, <laughs> and we've also hired three of our research fellows, amazing pipeline into like-minded people. And then about a third of our work, which is growing, which is part of the story of how to sustain research in a practice like ours, is paid R&D, where the motivation and goal or objective of the project is exclusively to create new knowledge around different types of work that we do. And that body of work is growing and growing significantly. We're only 200 people in three offices, so we're actually quite smaller, at least than most of the firms up here. And so we're really actively trying to make sure that each of those buckets gets adequate support from Methune, knowing that it's great that a lot of our research is generating revenue, that's awesome. But uh, we always wanna make sure that we can have the grassroots effort and the connection to the academic world is, is super important. And I will say, we, we watch it closely, we monitor it closely, we're really committed to making research work at Methune. And in 2024, the lines will cross. So where the research that's funded and billable and generating revenue, the profit from that research, not the revenue, but the profit, will actually sustain the indirect costs of the academic pursuits and the kind of management shepherding and are, allocation. Are you suggesting that you can make money off of research? I am suggesting that there is a model in which you can That's be profitable, self-sustaining, and that wasn't our stated goal, but yeah. over time, almost 10 years, we've managed to get to that point where it's becoming self-sustaining, which is really important, I think. Yeah, so let's let's get as specific as, as you're all allowed to share, and I wanna bring it back to Pablo, since I cut him off, um, which is, you all have like a pretty broad remit. There's a lot of technology and other types of issues swirling around, or maybe just technology. That's, a, that's another question is like all of this technology. But um, can I, I'd like to hear from each of you, like what, what are you, name two specific things that you are like personally responsible for delivering to your firm. What are like two really important research objectives? Don't give me the like 10 pillars of you know AI to like blockchain, like what what is the specific thing that like you are hired Damn. to do and to deliver that is 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 really important? Uh, so first, maybe the most important one. Uh, so I have to make sure that we have uh, the right skill set to deliver the projects we design. Hmm. Okay, so that means that um, although we have a an R and D or applied I prefer to say applied research than just R&D, but um, you can call it whatever. Although, although we have a specific team, um, I am also uh, uh, responsible for having a kind of a clear and a, an applicable strategy to um, deliver our projects that uh, are particularly complex. Yeah. So that's the that's the most important one. Yeah. So um, very directly tied to the projects. Yeah. yeah. And the second one, it's about the future. It's about um, trying to understand. Um, how technology, thinking in, as Mark like kind of mentioned, you know, in the kind of the next ten years, uh, may uh, be beneficial for us as a business. Um, and so that's, for instance, very tied to AI at the moment. Mm -hmm. Does that okay. answer the question? Yeah, that's a good answer. Yeah, I don't know what to say because that's that's pretty much what what I'm supposed to do. I think I'll just add one more, um, which is education. So a big part of my role is to open doors for our design computation leaders, um, to enable all of our teams, to enable communication, and just um, you know hit higher bars of and standards for dis digital transformation in the firm. And is it? Is it education, are you talking about kind of upskilling the firm or are you talking about understanding things outside of your core disciplinary domain or something? It's actually like, both. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and, and this kind of, this will start getting into like more than two things. 
um, but it's both. It's upskilling the firm, it's incorporating emerging technologies and being ready for what comes next, communicating with our leadership, um, being able to demonstrate our impact, uh, but then also, you know, bring in applied research from other fields. So we have um, partnerships with, um, you know, for example, John Medina, um, so bringing neuroscience and well-being and tying that in with technology and how we can apply it to projects or we, we were also also work with UW um, quite a bit and we're part of um, you know their research and sponsoring their work so sort of you know tying all of those pieces and communicating with the rest of the firm and our projects to make sure that there's a symbiotic relationship yeah, with both yeah, of making them. those connections cool yeah. thank you yeah there's not much to say we're meant to deliver on projects and to do r and I mean we're yeah. you're like I already answered this one <laughs> I was hoping they'd get more laughs, but it didn't really. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's a good question because, to a certain extent, it's that. Yeah. I mean, you can you can put as many words as you want to it, but that's what it is, right? Right. Okay. So. Yeah. But maybe yeah. that falls into. I was thinking two buckets for me that I'm asked to tell the company where we should be innovating, and then they tell me when we come up with something specific if that's meeting that. And one is in looking at kind of the future of the business and what the goals are in terms of markets and project types and sectors and where we can innovate within the work we're doing there. So for example, with work in China kind of going down and looking more in North America, we're not seen as really placemakers from that work, but that's a huge component in the work we're looking at in North America. So how do we use urban data analytics and quantifying human experience to give us a leg up in placemaking? So I kind of pitch that knowing that that's a need and then we develop tools around it. And then the other side is in kind of how we do the work and deliver it internally. And so that's around automation and efficiencies, embed embedding intelligence. So that's, for example, building a core recommendation engine, learning from our past, how we plan past cores linking that to an area tracker with stacking chart generation that makes the most beautiful stacking charts you've ever seen. Yeah, th th you bring up an interesting point there too, like the urban tools that you've been working on, th those aren't just tools that you're selling to clients or using on single projects, you're actually using those to explore new areas of work, especially when work has to shift geographically, yeah. Yeah, and that, that, that's actually sort of a third category, exploring new service types that okay. expand our scope to make us more resilient, but maybe get us into our more traditional bread and butter work because we're further downstream. Yeah. I gave you each two things because I knew some of you would steal a third. Well, you gave it. <laughs> I prompted it, it's true. Uh, let's see, so I'll, I'll try to go two things. Uh, I'll go maybe highest level, uh, somewhat generic, but hopefully useful, and then maybe a little more specific. Um, is this being recorded? Are we? <laughs> I just want to know what I, I can think and so, can. and also it was just pointed out to me that this is being broadcast as well. Oh, great, okay. I'll be, like, yeah, I'll try to be, like, said, somewhat yeah. vague, but somewhat specific. Uh, let's see, so at, at the highest level, I think, you know, it's really my responsibility to the firm to kind of nurture the culture of innovation and research and do so in a way that allows it to never be superficial, so that it's not just research so that we can say we're innovative, but that it's truly generating new knowledge that matters. So I, I feel deep responsibility for that and creating a culture of empowerment at Methune that allows for others to take risks and do so in a way that's moving the, the firm towards the future. So creating that culture, nurturing the cul culture and empowering, I feel the responsibility for that. On the more kind of like, you know, and maybe more interesting answer for, um, and more detail is with some of this work and especially being the one who's sort of doing the weird projects, uh, they don't necessarily fit within the confines of traditional work. So, uh, you know, I personally have been advocating for a while in new models of working with, say, for instance, startups. Startups where we're supporting with research, and doing what we can do well, uh, but being imaginative about how we might accept compensation for that. And so, you know, uh, recently having 
And every system that we have in place is built to not do this. So when we ask our risk management team, it's like, no, and here's the 25 reasons why we shouldn't exchange some portion of fee for equity. And we ask our accounting team and finance team, and there's like 50 reasons why we shouldn't do it. Uh, and so it's really complicated and it's hard, but we have managed in the last couple of years to imagine new models of compensation to where maybe we're not exchanging all fee for equity in some unknown or a startup or some company we're supporting, but we're exchanging, to be specific, profit for equity. So we're taking a risk and saying, hey, you know what? We're gonna try to break even on this work, right? Uh, not doing it for free, right? We're too busy to do that, uh, and our time and resources are too valuable, but we're gonna break even, and we're gonna exchange what we would have taken in profit for equity. Right? And then we're in it together. And I will just say that's extraordinarily hard. I've advocated for it for a while when I believe in who we're working with. Uh, it's hard to make it happen. Huge risk and huge reward. Uh, so I'm also on the hook for things like that where I feel the responsibility to then deliver when we believe that something is for the good of the order, for the good of the firm. Yeah, and you're starting to also get it. You know, there's, I think all of these firms, there's there's friction. There are naysayers. There are people who think that you're probably not spending firm capital in the best way. I'm curious if any of you have a specific example of like a moment of crisis where, where the because this happens. There are ebbs and flows. There are lean times and fat times in firms, and the first thing they're going to go after is what is perceived, at least, as as overhead. I'm wondering if anybody has anecdotes about tough times where you've had to pivot, reinvent. Uh, disassemble a group, form a new group, do R&D in secret, um, you know, what, do these things happen? Like, it's not all good, right? Like, you're yeah, they don't <laughs> even know we're here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are you allowed to be at this yeah. conference? No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I'll just, I still have the mic, so I'll just say, yeah, you know, uh, we really look at our hours carefully and try to maximize the value of what we're doing. And so since starting in 2016, the the slope is basically like that. Every year, kind of the time, effort, and dollars put towards research was essentially doubling. And so we knew we couldn't sustain that, knowing that we essentially manage it with two people, more or less, really dedicated to it, and then you know, half the firm participates in some way or another. So we really had to work with leadership at Methune to say, hey, we believe deeply in this, we know we're going like this, and we want to flatten that, right? And to make sure that we plateau at a point where we're maximizing every last second that we spend on research. So not so much friction, but a realization that there's, you know, a diminishing return or benefit to the time spent kind of doing the research. And everyone, for people watching on the live stream, Methune has been very supportive of all of our weird efforts. So <laughs> just throwing that out there. Okay, everybody watching the live stream is under NDA. Yeah, I mean, yeah, do you have I can respond? Well, I mean, yeah, if, if everyone signed the NDA. Yeah. I think it's always challenging. Um, uh, you know, I was thinking, is it because you know, uh, maybe our team is particularly young um, in terms of you know, years uh, as, a, as a group, uh, but uh, we, we thought, I think we started kind of uh, with a very strong strategy, and you know, in a way it was, okay, well, the strategy is good, you know, we implement it, you know, done deal. And it wasn't necessarily like that, um, and the reason uh, the reason uh, behind that is uh, that we work on projects, you know, and we design, you know, buildings and, and pieces of cities and, and objects, and we need people to do that, and, and the skills that the people need to have for this project to happen um, were the same skills that, you know, the people that was joining the team had. You know, so, uh, so if you needed someone that was really skilled, the first place to go and grab someone to help was the specialist team. You know, so uh, so the transition uh, from kind of uh, starting the, the kind of the team to have to have actual uh, actually a team with you know full time assignment to um, apply research um, was quite long. You know, and I don't think that is um, although we are there kind of now. Uh, I think still, you know, always and constantly evolving, you know. Um, yeah. yeah. So I have to, oh, go ahead. Do you have a response? Do, do you want to go ahead? No, I want you to go. Um, so I agree with Pablo. Um, it, it's always difficult. Um, but I think one thing that has worked for us um, 
quite well is the fact that like all of we had a distributed system and all of our design computation leaders and technologists live within project teams most of their time is spent on billable um, projects and they look for efficiencies and innovation um, through their own project work and that means that our overhead has been um, you know, really, really little, and whatever little that is has been, you know, unan we have una unanimous support from our leadership for that. Um, and a lot of, you know, what that allows us to do is actually find issues and actually look at like, you know, if you're developing a custom tool, understand what the project needs and, you know, be obsessed with that. Um, but at the same time, come at a firm wide level and solve problems together and collaborate and, you know, tap into each other um, and do large scale R&D without, you know, without actually going through a period of, um, you know, extreme overhead, um, for example. So just that structure has been really valuable um, and robust for us. Yeah, yeah, it seems like there's a balance between kind of top-down mandates and then bottom-up, like how do you recognize Absolutely. patterns in the projects? Yeah. Absolutely. That's gotta be a tough, that's gotta be a tough thing in a really large firm, right? Like, you talk about, you know, the distribute, yeah, you say like, oh, we distribute it, and that makes sense, resource-wise, but then I'm like, wait, who's, who's managing that now? Because that's, that's complicated, right? So what's the communication infrastructure for that? Yeah, so, um, you know Nate and Kristen mm. and me. So um, three of us manage our design computation team. We also have a really, really strong BIM team. Um, and then of course tech services. The great part is that um, from an organizational level, all of us are under one digital umbrella. So that automatically helps us communicate better between you know, different technology parallels and provide um, sort of you know, support in a way that's more cohesive. Um, especially as we look at AI and then, you know, look at cloud computing and those kind of things where we really need our infrastructure team to work with us. Um, that's been a really helpful thing. And then we are distributed into different studios. We're looking at our own projects and working on our own projects, but we've um, found a really great rhythm of meeting with each other, you know, every other week or every month and sort of, you know, showing what we're working on, discussing problems. Um, all of the leaders that we have in our team are deep experts in their own technology vertical. And we, we love that. We love the fact that they all speak different languages. They, they all have a diverse skill set and interest. Um, they all lead their studios differently and look at, you know, digital trends differently, um, and and what we do now, um, and you know, especially over the last few years as our communication has ramped up and we really have a sense of team with each other, um, we tap into each other very often. Um, and that's been working really, you know, we're distributed, but I can tap into someone and, for example, when we look at our data strategy, um, I'm not a BIM person and I don't know how to get any Revit data out, but I can just tap into one of our BIM leaders. Um, Leo is an interoperability expert who's here uh, with me and I tap into him and I'm like, Leo, can you get me this data, get this data so out? So get into a career in R&D and then you don't have to use Revit, is what you're saying. <laughs> I like that. Oh, oh wow, we got, we got applause for that. Um, I'm thinking one more question and then audience q and I have, we're good? Okay, okay, cool. Um, thank you. Oh, is there, God, they had a, you had it up and everything, sorry. Um, you mentioned AI, it's gonna keep coming up. So like, let's, let's talk about this a little bit. Like, it's hard when, when you have a, when you have a mandate like what you have, and there's so much swirling in the world with buzzwords, metaverse, digital twin, AI. Well, you know, what is even AI? So we can probably, like, how do you not chase those butterflies? Which I think is a, you know, obvious question. You're experts and you know kind of what to work on. But specifically with AI, like, that's a very, like, what does that mean, right? So what, what, is, um, what is a distraction about this current kind of, frenzy of AI and what's really meaningful? Like what are specific problems that you're looking to solve with AI? And can you even get into the specifics of the methodologies like, you know, a particular type of machine learning to solve a particular problem? Martha, like, yeah, Luke, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Yes, like uh, when people see things that are really shiny that do great stuff that have no meaning. They get really happy and they go around like chasing them and do stupid things. <laughs> I 
And then present at conferences like this? And they, they, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Why not? Why not? We all do it. And I think, uh, particular, I, I'm, I was laughing so hard when you made your comment. I do not understand what people's fascination is with um, diffusion models and the fascination. I, I see people present uh, kind of teaching people how to do prompt engineering to create an image yeah. that they then try to replicate that image using Grasshopper. And I'm thinking, what, okay, why? What is it that, how is that a creative process? Are you trying to write yourself out of the equation? Because it's like plain stupid uh, for me. Um, and I, I think I, I was listening to the answer before about R&D and how um, companies see it. And I think this is the fundamental problem, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that with all due respect to everybody who's in that room, in this room rather, uh, we are so, we are so much into our heads and what we do, we think it's the best thing after sliced bread, that of course a lot of companies will not support you. If you go with everything that pops into your head that the best thing after sliced bread and you think because you can write a for loop, you're great and everybody should bone you, <laughs> then of course you're not going to be kind of uh, be promoted uh, in the company or given money to do anything or actually be supported. And of course your group is the first one that is going to be sliced when like the industry goes down and that happens every five, six years always, right? So the fundamental issue here is how can you actually see beyond the fad how can you see what you can do as something that can help people within the company? Because what you're trying to do is better design, whether it's structural design or architectural design. So when uh, we, we saw machine learning, when Pix to Pix came out and everybody was oh, Pix to Pix, we were like thinking, okay, what can we do with that? And the idea back then was, all right, can we create a generative system? What is the, what are these uh, kind of systems good at? They're good at automating, they're good at, um, guessing a good solution or being trained to do so. So we trained the system effectively to understand what the deformation would be for a multi-layered thermoactive laminate. Uh, and if we wanted a particular deformation, let's imagine you want a facade that when it's heated, it deforms to create, create a shading. But because these laminates are so uh, difficult to predict, you would have to run hundreds of thousands of analysis to find what is the actual layering in order to have the particular deformation that you want. So what we done, we trained the system to learn how to do that. So that was our first brush. Uh, back then we did it with Panos Michalatos from Autodesk uh, in 2018, uh, if I recall. And then after that we went into, okay, what can we use it for? Well, let's use it for surrogate modeling. So surrogate models are models that effectively can predict analyti uh, analysis that otherwise would take mi minutes or hours and they can do it in a fraction of a second. So we wrote, um, ML inference APIs directly within Rhino that allow people as they design to get a prediction on different analysis, let's say special visual connectivity, that usually when it's ex extended floor plate that can take quite a long time and it does it instantaneously. And you accept that you're going to compromise uh, accuracy with uh, speed. But if you're doing it at early stages, Effectively, what you're doing is helping people make the right decisions early on, and that's all you're trying to do here. You're trying to create that real-time feedback. You're trying to create things that train the designers to be better. You're trying to create a helper to the creative process and augmentation to the creative process. And so then with the rise of LLMs, we start thinking, okay, we're 55-year-old office. We have so much data. How can we actually create a system when we can search through that data using um, natural language processing? And, and so we build our own backend, and at the time we used Elasticsearch because the problem also is that people do not understand the minutiae about these things. O not all models are the same, and not all machine learning models have been trained in the same way. So chat three, GPT 3.5, for example, was extremely, um, I don't know uh, how to say it. Uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, I, don't, I cannot find the right word. It was, it, it was cute in a way that it was trying to improvise, right? Yeah, so you would ask something and it would like be 90% right, but the 10% would be so fundamentally wrong. It was devastating. Uh, GPT-4 is great, right? But uh, we kind of made an effort to get GPT-4. Before that, we had uh, the API for Elasticsearch. We did an entire en en uh, engine on our design guides, which are very precious for us. But we did that with a mechanism where we were kind of training the system and changing the parameters to do uh, 
we have a group of people who were checking the answers, and then based on the answers, we'll check, change the parameters to ensure that every time the answers were getting better and better and better. So even if you try to do this, even with models that exist, unless you train them in a particular way, you're going to get wrong things out. And then with diffusion models, we effectively created um, the other big problem is IP. Most people do not understand that all these things, effectively, anything you do in mid-journey, the IP goes with mid-journey, right? Any image you have created, anything you have uploaded, say goodbye to that IP because that now belongs to mid-journey. Um, so stable diffusion is the same. So what we've done, we'll take the open API from stable diffusion, use it within our own servers so that we could safeguard our data. And again, using ML and inference API allowed the system, as we were modeling in 3D, to be able to get suggestions on that 3D model and then create an ML portal where we could uh, kind of cross-check these suggestions um, against each other. So um, these are a yeah. few of the things that we have been doing. But it's, it's again, it is mostly like, rather than trying, if, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And as Sherif Arabishu, who's my lead in AI in the group, he said, why do we want to find a nail for this particular hammer with this, which is Gen AI? Why don't we just see what are the actual problems that we have and try to solve these problems with this technology and do something for what it's good for? Yeah, yeah. Luke, do you have a follow-up? <laughs> <laughs> so I was thinking, there's sort of two buckets of AI for us. There's the generative models mm -hmm. and the cat's out of the bag on that broadly across the studio. So what we're doing is one, making sure all the data that's going in there is protected, not being used to train the models. That's just sort of default. But then we're, we're helping create community groups and figuring out how people are using it and refining it to very specific things. Like, oh, mid-journey isn't this broad design exploration tool, it's a precedent ideation tool, good in concept. Awesome, we're gonna focus on that. Stable diffusion through Verus, instant renderings, time saver. Similar things with ChatGPT and providing those sort of resources. And then on the other side, it's finding very specific problems and goals, and then half the time it's actually not machine learning or AI that we're looking for. It's some sort of maybe just a better web-based solution for exploring a data set rather than trying to get insights out of it. Or it's very targeted like we have tens of thousands of floor plans and using image segmentation to classify cores and core elements and then using a similarity search so we can recommend the best cores to look out so junior designers when they're getting started on a project have, they don't have to wait on the expert in the office. So something very kind of, kind of targeted. Yep. Um, but one, one example was in 2018, also because we we're creating these large computational design, urban scale models, we're like there's lots of data for us associated with these. We should be able to use some sort of machine learning to get insights that we could not get out of those. And the machine was never smarter than a human with design knowledge. So instead, we built a 3D web platform with different ways of searching and filtering the data. And we found that a human was much better looking at a form, looking at the performance of it, and relating that back. So, ah, the towers are distributed this way. That's actually opening up the views. I got it. Teaching a machine to do that was impossible. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, even just the ability to search like a firm's portfolio for internal precedents. I remember like working at KPF and you know the principal might refer you to a few prior projects for a particular facade problem, but like to have some kind of interactive tool um, to bring that up is, is an interesting thought. Did you have something to add? Yeah. Yeah, so um, there are two ways that we're looking at. One is just enabling exploration. So a lot of people in our firm, a lot of designers are already, you know, on a mid-journey and dally and chat GPT bandwagon. And one of the key things that we've done is look at ethics and education um, and internal policies. And we're kind of doing that in collaboration with other firms also. Um, so we're part of the large um, firm round table and we're trying to look at AI policy that can, and an educational curriculum actually that will then translate to you know all of the other firms being able to use and apply it so um, 
you know, we're already doing it, stable diffusion and all of this is, you know, exciting for designers, we're visual people, um, and, and our idea is to, you know, enable them and educate them to use it um, in the best possible use cases and to listen from them as to how they're using it. So, you know, for example, we've seen a lot of people use um, the image generation tools for simple things like creating diagrams for presentations. Um, and that's a perfectly valid use case. Um, and, you know, it saves you time and makes you more efficient. Um, and on the other hand, you know, apart from all, all of the stuff that you guys have been talking about, I think we're you know, thinking about the same things. Um, but the other bit is also just really, really boring use cases. Um, so, for example, looking at door schedules and all of our Revit models and trying to suggest the right doors based on your project typology. Or, um, you know, not even looking at 3D models, but looking at data like contracts and our billing data and project timelines and looking at, you know, risk management and better estimation of those things. So, we also have, like, you know, a lot of, like, non-glamorous use cases that we think are a better fit. Um, for some of these models, and we're starting to look at those. Yeah. Do you guys have a more gla glamorous use case? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've been using it for business insights, and it was fantastic. I mean, it took much more time to specify that we were working with our management group and to get out the data for business insights. I'm not, I can't go into details about that and, and bits and stuff, but uh, for me, this was the most exciting thing. Like, when yeah, we're doing it. Exciting. Trying, like, uh, you were talking about how you're looking into new markets and stuff. Like, through the data that you have, a lot of these things become much easier to, to gauge. And uh, we, we have uh, had a lot of uh, uh, great uh, fun, I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> I have another uh, glamorous, uh, glamorous way of using it because uh, uh, we've been uh, using it for uh, finding kind of internal tutorials for Revit. So uh, yeah, so you can customize basically, you know, the, whatever you need to learn uh, based on the documentation we have created, you know, uh, through the years in that lovely software. Um, so that's another one. Uh, but for sure, I mean, understanding anything that produces data in your company, you know, and so, you know, we one of the first things that we tested with was uh, new business, you know, um, and I think I'm not, uh, I'm not against it about image generation at all. Um, what I'm about, uh, a little bit against uh, about is to um, uh, kind of advocating for a, a technology that um, you don't know anything about, and and it's it's funny that um, kind of uh, we get uh, kind of fans uh, kind of asked to uh, talk about these things you know over and over again you know and as we are the experts and I don't think we are. Um, I think we're kind of learning, and, and this is a good time to actually learn about this, and we learn by doing, you know, it's, yes. you know, how we do what we do, I think. So, um, so we have to be using these tools, you know, we have to be trying to uh, think about the problems we need to solve, and then, you know, see whether, you know, this technology can help you, and it's not, it's not the right technology for sure, you know, um, but you definitely have to learn about it and understand how it works, because uh, it's very simple to say we have a lot of data, but if you don't understand how much time will take you to actually structure and label whatever data you have, you know, before you start the training process, you know, you just can't assume anything, you know, uh, that's gonna come out of that. And, and, and even more importantly, you have to understand why you wanna get out of it, you know, yeah. um, because whatever data you fit in needs to be strictly related to whatever you wanna get out. Yeah. And I imagine that's something that a lot of people in the audience are thinking a lot about, which is how do I define a problem that is, that, you know, lends itself well to being solved or at least partially solved by AI. And once I do, where the hell do I get started? You know, how do I get into know? Well, some of us are probably computer scientists of sorts, but I don't know if anybody's, you know, writing like fundamental technologies, we have to direct them, right? You're kind of arbiters of the new technology coming from outside of the domain and trying to figure out where, where to leverage it best for your firm. And I think with that, we will go to audience q and I've been informed, person raising your hand up there, that you're not allowed to ask questions from up there anymore because it's bad acoustics and all the mics are down here. So can you please walk down here? Yeah, yeah. OK. In the meantime, is there anyone already down here? who has a question for our panel. Okay, well then we'll wait for this gentleman. Oh no, there's a hand, all right.
Thank you. Um, you have a question regarding adoption. Uh, I can imagine that in your teams you have probably a lot of people who are really have an innovative mindset and really tech savvy. Um, but I can imagine also it's re really important for your departments to make sure that the things that you develop are adopted in the rest of the company where you have people who are maybe less tech savvy or less willing to learn and use new stuff. So how do you manage that? I'll just go real quick on that, and I think it gets a little bit to our overall philosophy of how we we have deep expertise concentrated in sort of one area of the practice, but everybody is project focused, with the idea being that if you're a deep expert or at least aware enough to impact your team or influence your team or educate your team about what could be done or what a process could be, I think that's a, an approach that's been working for us. So just philosophically making sure that Anything we do relative to R&D or digital design, we're trying to put in the hands of project team members doing the work to have more of a uh, kind of pervasive impact on the, uh, on the practice. Yeah, that's a, a huge challenge that we've struggled for years, mostly in the form of building really nice grasshopper definitions with good instructions and running sessions and then no one but experts using them. And so over the past couple of years, we've shifted. And what we're doing is we're putting any tools we build up on the cloud and behind APIs. And then we're building interfaces where the users are already working. So we're coming to them. And that also kind of decouples it so we can point it at um, any interface. And then we're also using a AWS microservice called CloudWatch that allows us to monitor um, errors. So as soon as we see an error from a tool, we reach out directly to the user, let them know we caught that, we're working on it so they don't bounce off. Hmm. Um, we can also see what tools are being used and what aren't. So maybe we do some user interviews to see why they're not using those tools or we don't worry about supporting them and we deprecate them. We're also using it for version control for grasshopper definitions that are out in the wild. So if we've fix an error, we can figure out who's actually using it and go find them. Like a full-on product manager. Yeah. Someone asked me who's the project manager at KTS, and I was like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, most of our processes are CI-CD processes. We're developing everything in Azure, and we approach the uh, products that we develop uh, as uh, software products. So we will start nowadays with a customer discovery. If we have a good idea based on the problem that we keep uh, seeing popping time and time again, we will uh, identify 20, 30, 40 people in the company. We will run interviews in terms of like, what are their pay points? What do they need? We're not going to tell them what we're trying to create. We will ask them what they're trying to do and why they fail doing it. And you will be surprised of how many preconceptions that we have on any given software completely get shattered at that point, and we realized that maybe we're trying to solve the, the wrong problem. So I think we, by doing that, we're trying to effectively create a process where we approach everything as a software, with the focus being the customer, which is the designer. Uh, because we did a lot of work in the past by having a great idea and think that this is going to work, and obviously like 90% of that fails. Because a great idea doesn't mean that it's a great idea for everybody, it just means that you had a good idea and everybody can have those. So I think the, the focus nowadays is mostly on approaching it as something that somebody else is going to use and trying to solve their problems, listening to what they need. And through these CICD processes, we make sure that we can keep updating our software. We're having a pipeline where different people basically, it, it is a proper software development with sprints, with different people checking codes for different people, and deployment office-wide through SSO, and making sure first it's deployed in a small group of people, they trial it, we see whether it fails, we, we kind of change the front end when that doesn't work, et cetera, up until the point where we feel this is something that can be deployed office-wide, and then we go like that. Cool. Thank you. Um, all right, quick. Okay. Let's be real quick. I will do my best, but so I This guy came all the way downstairs. <laughs> I have a lot to say on this. Okay, so <laughs> adoption for us has been... 
<laughs> Adoption for us has been a key sort of problem that we've been trying to solve. And we, we attack it from a few different ways. So one, for example, uh, very early on, we discovered that not all of our designers want to get into Grasshopper and the nitty -gritty gritties of any kind of tool. Um, and similar to KP, um, KPF's approach, and I'm sure a lot of other firms, we're moving towards web technologies, we're moving towards cloud technologies, but most importantly, we're employing UX designers who really think about the interface and about how to make it easy for a de our designers to use something. Um, and I think like one big kickstart that, and I would be amiss if I didn't mention that, is Andrew Human's um, Human UI, and that was developed oh, by... Yeah. Yeah, so Used that everywhere, was, largely on Exactly, by and you know, that's, that's enabling our work at NBBJ, but also across the entire industry. Um, so, you know, having that UI UX uh, mindset has, you know, become part of our ethos. Um, the second, and it again started before I joined NBBJ, is to have a centralized toolkit. So we have a library of tools that anybody can go into and try to find resources. Um, we've just expanded it to you know, move beyond having just the tools, but also having learning resources and case studies so you can really understand how these tools are applied on projects and the kind of efficiencies that you get out of that. Um, and then finally, we just literally go out there and do studio road shows and be really vocal about the tools that we're creating, try to train studios and teams and do it again and again and again till they remember that tool and remember to use it the next time they have that same problem. Um, another thing that we've done is um, we've started to develop tools from an educational point of view. So we just released Zero Guide, which is now you know, available for everybody in the industry to use. And it was developed as an educational tool to train our designers on problems related to carbon, on the language of carbon, and be really design focused when we were looking at it. Um, and, and that just, you know, started as a tool internally, as an educational tool, and then eventually, you know, turned into something that we released everywhere, because we figured that education and technology kind of go hand in hand if you want to look at adoption and actual impact in the industry. Okay. All right. People are getting very thirsty. <laughs> so you're, you're going to bring us home, gentlemen from upstairs. That's the dream, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so I'm curious, as, as folks who are sort of the people responsible for asking the big questions within your firms and within the industry as, as a whole, what are the questions that we're not asking or that we should be asking beyond, like, what are we doing with AI? Like, what is going to be next beyond AI? Do we even have to consider that yet? Or is it just we need to continue to be reactionary because we're not necessarily driving change in the world, we're driving change in our industry? Is there something that we should be asking beyond what it is that we're doing day to day that needs to be looking like 10 years from now, 20 years from now? I think you should first be asking, do you have the right skills to be doing this? And what are the skills that you need? I think we all, all uh, overhype ourselves, uh, thinking that we do much more than we actually do. To do a lot of these things, you need, like, it's interesting you were talking about uh, UX, UI, like Paul is doing all our front-end development with another guy in the group, and they're front-end developers, and that's their job, right? because that was something that was required, to have front-end developers, to have back-end developers, to have data scientists in the team, to have people that are ex have explicit knowledge that is not just about architecture, but is very boutique and very particular, but it's part of a bigger story. So I think the first thing you need to, to ask yourself is not what is coming, it's like, are you equipped to deal with what is coming? And if you're not, what do you need to do uh, with your team, not just you? Like, the, the entire thing is also that, this, this industry does not play well with lone wolves. It's actually a really, really bad habit. And the more successful teams are the teams that are close-knit, and they know how to work together with each other and work uh, with each other's uh, strengths that should be different, right? And put the team above everything else. So if you manage to do that, I think, uh, and you have that mentality, then you, you're well-equipped for what is coming. I just want to follow that up. Uh, because I think that's key. Communication is key, but um, collaboration is key. And I don't think it ends uh, in the team. Mm -hmm. you know, um, I have, a, I suppose, a, a nice example with your team, for instance. You know, so getting teams from different firms together, you know, and uh, just to talk about you know, what are you up to. You know, it's amazing. You know, and I think 
that changes, you know, how we do things, you know, because all of a sudden we're all learning and, you know, from each other and we're sharing kind of our, our questions, you know, and if I, yeah, well, I have the same kind of issue or the same question, so well then, it must be something, right? So uh, we, we may be headed in the right direction. And even if you're not kind of um, formally collaborating on a project, those opportunities already you know, make you to work in an environment where you know that you, know, you, you may be after kind of something important. And I think about what are the actual questions, you know. Uh, <laughs> um, Don't start too big of a new clause. That's tricky. Bring us home. That's Bring tricky because you know how many years have we have we been talking about you know interoperability and you know oh like uh, what is have, yeah. what is BIM and documentation and what are the tools we use? We still talk about these things. Yeah. Every single year. Yeah. You know. Um, so the question is, yeah, what's the biggest elephant in the room? I love I love the idea of finishing this on the note of like how do we take that long term trajectory and say it's bigger than us, right? It's investing in more people with different backgrounds. It's collaborating externally. It's whatever Luke was probably going to say next, but I'm cutting him off. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>